And when I was thinking, I often wonder about what's the best way to talk about this, uh, what's going on in terms of the, uh, the farrowing barn and, and the interaction between the sow and the litters and so on and so forth. And I came up with this bright idea, so you can like it or not like it, is this idea of a barn dance. It's this relationship, this very dynamic relationship between the sow and her litter. Uh, things are changing and changing constantly and changing rapidly. Uh, I also should step back and say I'm a, I'm a lactation biologist. I'm not a swine person. My background is actually in dairy, but I've done swine research for almost 25 years now, directly and indirectly. And I find this, uh, this, this compared to cows, I find swine and, and uh, again, this idea of the, the sow litter interaction being very uh, fascinating to me. And again, I'm going to share some of that with you today. So I just want to kind of give you some, some background. So it's not like this. This is not what we're talking about here. Uh, what we're talking about is the relationship between these guys, the mammary glands of the sow, and the sow. And so that's what we're really kind of after. Most of you, if not all of you in here, are concerned about a whole bunch of these things, hundreds, thousands of these kinds of relationships. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to cover one, one sow, her mammary glands, her pigs, and then especially, and I hope to convince you by the time you leave, that somewhere in your thought process, you need to kind of get down this idea that these two are a unit. This guy impacts this, this impacts this. And so we're going to really get, dig down and really kind of get into what's going on here in terms of this relationship. So we're going to leave the one there on the left side and focus on, on the kinds of uh, levels on the, on the other side here. <clears throat> when I teach class, I usually try to remind students that uh, lactation, uh, mammary development, and so on is a, is, a, is a long developmental process. We're not going to deal with these other stages down here or just very briefly touch on pregnancy. Uh, in fact, actually, I don't think I'm going to touch on pregnancy here because I'll just to shorten it a little bit. Lactogenesis, initiation of lactation. I spend a lot of time on lactation. And I need to introduce you to a couple of concepts here with regard to involution or after you wean them, what happens to the mammary gland there. So I'm going to focus initially on lactation. This is a stylized milk yield curve for a sow. So she's peaking at around three weeks of age. So most of you, if you're weaning in that ballpark, you're weaning them when mom's getting just hitting stride. She's just getting up there, but then she'll start coming down fairly quickly thereafter. So this is a typical, what, what happens there? What's causing this increase in milk yield? And we know we have a fair amount of data that it's an increase in cell number. So an increase in mass of the mammary tissue, increase in the number of cells that are involved in, in making milk. So we know that because from farrowing to a peak lactation, there's over a 50% increase in the wet weight of the mammary gland. And there's a 100% increase in the DNA. And what you think of it here is DNA basically equals cells or, or is equivalent to cells. So we're basically doubling the number of cells in the mammary gland from the time she farrows until the time she uh, hits peak lactation. And the key to this is that's being driven by the piglets. It's being driven by milk removal. And so again, it starts to get into that relationship between the pigs and uh, the mammary gland, lactation, how much milk is produced, and all those kinds of things. During pregnancy, unlike a cow where a lot of times they're pregnant and lactating at the same time, and in the case of the animals you guys work with, they're not. They're either one or the other. Uh, hormones are associated with uh, in, uh, increase in mammary development during pregnancy, estrogen, progesterone, relaxin, prolactin, growth hormone, insulin, glucocorticoid, it's just a long, long list of these things. These are some of the major ones. But during lactation, something significant shifts. There's a significant shift here in what's going on. So hormones are still important. I'll get to that in a second. But what we're really talking about is milk removal, removing milk from the mammary gland. Removing milk from the mammary gland involves milk ejection. We'll get to that later on, but it's not identically the same thing. So <clears throat> what we find is that there are two components to that. One is a local response, gland by gland. Each gland is separate in that sense. And then we also have what I call systemic responses, uh, includes hormones, so prolactin being secreted from the, the anterior pituitary is going around through the blood and going to all the glands. So all the glands are seeing the prolactin, uh, have a chance to respond to the prolactin at the same time, depending on what's happening in this gland versus this gland, may make a lot of difference on what, what the response of those glands is to that prolactin. Again, we're going to talk a lot about milk removal here. <coughs> Again, I'm a dairy guy. Milk removal, we have this thing called a milky machine. It's made of rubber and steel. It never, ever, ever changes. It's got a vacuum. I'm assuming you, you maintain your vacuum right and you change your liners, et cetera, et cetera. It's the same throughout lactation in the cow. The cow changes. She changes by stage of lactation, but this never changes. If we milk her two or three times a day, we determine that. 
Uh, even in a uh, robotic milking system, they're only milking three, four, five times a day, maybe six sometimes, but typically in that ballpark. On the other hand, that's the milking machine that you guys work with. This little fellow right here, this is the milking machine. And there's a bunch of them, and they're all a little bit different. Her mammary glands are all a bit different. And so this relationship between the pig and the mammary gland, it's very, it's, again, this is what fascinates me. You know, I, I, it gets kind of boring. You put the machine on the cow every time. That's the same. Well, this is a very much more dynamic situation. And, and on top of all that, <clears throat> if I can get it to go here, there we go. And the kind of breeds that you guys work, the kind of genetics you guys work with, there's a pretty strong teat order. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's, it's pretty strong. Uh, so this pig nurses this gland and doesn't shift around very much. Synchronized nursing, so they're nursing on a regular basis, whether that's 45 minutes, 50 minutes, whatever that case may be. And all those things I should point out are established pretty early on. So these, these two kind of things, teat order and synchronous nursing, are established within about the first 12 hours post fairing. So that first 12 hours, lots of things are going on. It's very dynamic, very dynamic, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. But then after that, <clears throat> what's, what's uh, causing this relationship to really get, get uh, very strong are, are these kinds of things right here. Again, these are things that you guys know. You kind of take it for granted. You don't really think much about it beyond that. We'll, we'll expand upon that here. Okay, <clears throat> getting down to the mammary gland. <clears throat> When milk is removed, either by milking the cow, suckling of the young, whatever the case may be, I can't reach up, I can't jump up quite that high there, so stimulation of prolactin secretion. Every time the animal is milked, suckled, mammary glands are massaged, there's a release of our prolactin from the, the uh, pituitary. That's going to impact the uh, effect on, excuse me, the uh, refilling of the mammary gland. There's also something, this is something you may or may not be more uh, aware of, something called feedback inhibitor of lactation. There's still a lot of controversy about what this is. But basically what it says is that the mammary epithelial cell, as it secretes milk out of the lumen of the, the alveolus, part of that process is actually secreting something into the lumen that turns right back around and inhibits further secretion. So it's called an autocrine factor. And this is just this name feedback because they couldn't come up with a better name, feedback inhibitor of lactation. Again, what it is is, is still a little, little bit ambiguous. Depends upon who you read and who you listen to, but the concept is certainly there. So as milk is being produced and secreted out of the cell into the lumen of the alveolus, it's turning around and shutting down further milk secretion. And so what we find is that if, it, if, uh, if, if milk is, uh, excuse me, this, we remove this feedback inhibitor of lactation, we remove the milk, it re allows refilling of the gland, Milk secretion is maintained, and you'll see here in a few minutes, if that's not the case, milk secretion shut down. It's self-limiting. So we have to keep removing the milk as, as we go along. <clears throat> so let's go back and look at a couple of these things. So I want to, first of all, talk a little bit about the prolactin, and then we'll get into talking a little bit about the fill and the relationship between those things. So in a dairy cow, prolactin secretion, if we think of these lines as representing a 24-hour period, cow, we milk her three times a day, you get these three surges of prolactin. All right, morning, afternoon, evening, morning, afternoon, evening, and so on and so forth. And, and it usually comes down to pretty well baseline in between. On the sow, on the other hand, as you know, she's being nursed a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot throughout the whole day. And so her prolactin never really, really comes all the way down until you actually take the, the, the pigs away. So prolactin's probably the hormone, not necessarily the case in the cow, but it is the hormone in terms of, 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 of swine, in terms of maintaining lactation. So it's... When I talk about that systemic effect, if you want to plug in the word prolactin, that's A-OK -okay by me because that's going to be the biggie as, as we go through this. One, there we go. OK, so what we have is uh, this idea of a teeter-totter, a, a balancing act between the systemic effect. Prolactin, the hormone, is a positive effect on refilling the gland, making more milk, milk making more milk after the milk's been removed. Accumulation of fill, feedback, and inhibitor lactation in a gland as a negative effect, it's shutting down. So it's this balance between these two things. <clears throat> so what we have is when an animal is uh, milked or the, the piglets nursed, they pretty much empty the gland out in the case of the, the pigs. Um, we get a strong signal on the prolactin. It's surging, prolactin is surging, telling the gland to refill. We remove the, the feedback in here of lactation. So there's not a very strong uh, uh, local effect on that particular gland. And over time, as milk accumulates in the gland, the prolactin effect kind of wanes a little bit. You get more and more of the effect here on the uh, local factors. And so the gland kind of refills, and uh, it starts stopping off. I mean, the cow takes 
Let's see, in a cow it takes about 35 hours from the time you milk her before milk secretion rate hits zero. Okay, and she's pretty flexible. She, you can do a lot of things to a cow in terms of time. And a pig, on the other hand, I think you'll see later on, we're not talking about that long a period of time before it really is starting to shut down. <clears throat> the piglets nurse again here, and we reset the clock. So it's going every time you go through a nursing bout, you're going through this kind of a process. This is balancing between the systemic effect, refilling the gland, refilling the gland, refilling the gland, and then this negative effect of the, the uh, accumulation of the, the feedback and of lactation within each gland. <coughs> what happens when milk is not removed? I kind of already alluded to this. Some of the, the word they use for this is milk stasis. Uh, there's no stimulation of prolactin secretion. This will be uh, weaning time when we take all the pigs away. And I think the book says in about two hours or so, you start to see prolactin declining a bit in terms of secretion of prolactin. Um, accumulation of feedback and of lactation in each of the glands, the glands that, where milk is not removed, that decreases further milk secretion. Again, this is the, really the take-home message here. Milk secretion of the gland is self-limiting. It shuts itself off, which makes, if you think, you just go ahead and think about it for a few seconds when you have a chance, it makes a lot of sense. If, the, if the, out in the wild, if the young dies, there's no sense in that female continuing to lactate. You want to shut down very quickly and then go on, hopefully, to the next reproductive cycle. This is why when you draw a high-producing cow off, he's still making a lot of milk. Her, her gland doesn't go boom because it shuts itself off. Okay, let's see how that fi figures into... I, I'm sorry, I need to talk about involution here very briefly and introduce you to, again, getting back this idea of what happens when milk is not removed. The key example, the most obvious example, is then at weaning. This is the difference between the mammary gland at, at the day of weaning. So this essentially is still lactating. This is what it looks like inside the gland. You can even see a little bit of white here where we've cut through the gland and there's still enough milk that it's oozing out of the, the ducts and the alveoli and kind of collecting there on the tissue. This is seven days post weaning, but when they're starting to cycle again. And you can see it's really regressed quite a lot. There's even a little bit of fat pad uh, in between the glands that is re reforming there. And what we find is that you get about a two-thirds drop in wet weight uh, between what was lactating and then over here at uh, day seven, again, wet weight drops very, very rapidly. Uh, so again, involution, if you don't keep removing the milk, this is kind of the extreme example, that gland and, or those glands are going to involute. Okay, let's go back to lactation and try to figure out how this fits in. There are a whole bunch of different kinds of things that come into play with regard to milk removal. So kind of the theme today is milk removal. Got to get the milk out of the gland. <clears throat> One of those is interval of, of, of suckling or frequency. By the way, there's, there's other things. I'll touch upon these guys. Uh, there are certainly other ones I'm not going to take time to talk about today, but these are some to kind of keep in mind that are fairly straightforward to think about. Uh, interval of, free, of suckling. <clears throat> I always thought this was kind of an interesting experiment. What they did was they said, okay, we're going to assume that 50 minutes is our gold standard uh, interval between nursings. Okay, so I have a little circle up there. So that's basically 100%. At 50 minutes, whatever the pigs are, are, are consuming, that's 100%. So then they asked the question, well, okay, if we have the intervals at 30 minutes, 70, and 120, or excuse me, 100 minutes, how does that change? How much more or less milk is there? And interestingly, at 35 minutes, it was pretty much already refilled. So it was, remember, it was pretty much empty here. There's not a lot of residual milk in, left in a pig after the piglet's nurse. And it went basically from here up to here. Again, there's a lot of variability here. So whether it's a little bit lower, so on and so forth, but never really left. And in about 35 minutes, it's pretty well filled up. But then if we kind of can take this to another level here, what you find is it doesn't keep going up. So this doesn't keep going like this. It's flat lining here pretty quickly. So at 70 minutes, maybe you've got another 10% more milk. At 100 minutes, 25% more milk. But if we translate that into some numbers, um, the, the other uh, Professor Hurley uh, is much better at numbers than I am, OK? So if you were there across the hall this morning, this is my attempt to do some calculating, all right? 144, uh, 1,440 minutes per day, assume 40 mils. And you'll see later on why I say 40 mils per nursing. At 35 minutes, 35 minute intervals is roughly 40 nursings per day. Calculate that out, that's about 1,600 mils per day. Again, this is just a ballpark estimate here. Uh, 70 minute intervals, there's a roughly about a 10% increase in, in the accumulation of milk within that gland. 20, there's, there's half as many nursings, so we got 44 mils, so that's 10% more than the 40. 
this is how what they're getting. So clearly, the longer the interval, they're getting less and less milk. There's no question about it. What can you do about it? Well, I'm not sure you can do a whole lot. This, this again, gets back to behavior of the, the sow and the pigs and so on and so forth. Uh, but, but clearly, those, those, oops, those uh, uh, litters that are nursing fairly often and getting milk out are going to be getting more milk during the course of a day than, than those that are, are uh, nursing at, at lower intervals. So it doesn't, there's, not a, there's not very much compensation in terms of gland refilling and, and, and making more milk. Okay, litter size, very quickly. Litter size, as you go up in litter size, and I realize that uh, a lot of this work was done before the, the fairly recent increase that you guys have had in litter size, so you have some other, other dynamics going on there. But litter size, as we go from, from say, low, I think usually the, we, when people have done this, either four or six, up to, say, 12 or something like that, and litter size, total milk yield by the, the sow, and total mammary mass, so that's all the mammary glands. Uh, oops, getting ahead of myself there, wrong button. Increases. So the litter size, the total mass increases. But if you look at what happens per pig and per gland, again, remember this tight teat order, this pig is nursing this gland, so there's that relationship between those two, uh, it's, it's actually going down. So the, as you get more uh, pigs on a sow, she gives more total milk, yes, but milk per pig is, is declining. So again, she can't kind of keep up with the whole thing and again, keep, keep, uh, uh, keep oops, keep doing that, keep, keep uh, increasing her, her milk yield per pig. Okay, these are some estimates of, of milk yield by litter size. Uh, again, a lot of these go back in the late 90s, so I'm not sure exactly where we are today on, on this. Um, and this is kind of where I, I just did a crude estimate of 40 mils per nursing. So just kind of a spot right in the middle here, 12 kilograms per day, 10 pigs in a, in a litter in that particular case, 30 nursings per day. This is where I roughly got the 40 mils from. So it's going to be extremely variable as to how much they're actually getting out. It depends upon the sow, depends upon the stage of lactation, et cetera, et cetera. And it also clearly depends. These, these would be done, by the way, on the same stage of lactation, just different litter sizes. So the more litter size, the more total milk is made, but again, less uh, milk per pig is being made or, or secreted. Okay, size of pigs. This is uh, where I really start hammering on this idea of this mammary gland pig unit, this idea that this gland is nursed by this pig. Think about these is, is one and the same. They're one and the same unit in terms of growth of the pig. So th uh, this is some, uh, some, some, oops, I keep doing that. Sung Woo Kim's work here a number of years ago, but others have published similar kinds of estimates. Average daily gain of a pig versus the mass of the gland, the mammary gland that that pig is suckling, is significant. It's not 100% by any means, or, 100, uh, or, or one, but it's, it's certainly very significant. So again, it's the idea that this guy demands something from this. This produces it, allows this to grow more, has higher demand, demands more, this grows more. These guys are, are growing kind of in concert. So physiologically, this is growing because this is removing the milk. This is growing because that's making more milk. So more demand, more gland, mammary gland tissue, more milk is made, and that's, that's what I'm talking about in terms of units. And of course, every pig is different. So the relationship between this guy and this is going to be different from this one and the gland right next door because of those local effects and the fact that it's removing milk. Maybe this one's bigger, stronger, faster, smarter, whatever the case may be, removing milk better and better than its neighbor right here. So this one's going to end up causing more mammary growth, more milk yield. This one's going to have a little less there. So that's assuming everything else is equal. So nutrition, you know, nutrition, nutrients are going to go through the blood. Again, uh, uh, prolactin is going to go through the blood, et cetera, et cetera. Those other things are systemic, so they're, those are going to be spread across all the glands. So the local factor that we're talking about here is a relationship here of actually removing this guy, removing the milk. Okay, milk letdown. How are we doing on time here? Oh, we're doing. I'm moving along here. Okay. You guys all know this thing. Everybody in here probably knows about milk ejection, oxytocin, that good stuff. So uh, the pigs stimulate the gland, uh, sends zero impulses to the brain, posterior pituitary releases oxytocin. That goes back by the blood to the mammary glands and causes the myoepithelial cells to contract and squeeze the milk out of the lumen of the alveolus down through the ducts and out. Now, uh, probably the best example of, of, of milk ejection, which is very effective without milk removal, is you can walk up to a cow 
a dairy cow, and you can stimulate her udder and she'll let her milk down. That doesn't mean anything removes the milk. So milk removal is not identically the same thing as milk ejection. Milk ejection is a very rapid process, physiological process that causes, in, increases intermammary pressure to kind of squeeze the milk, but if there's nothing on the other end pulling it out, or doesn't pull out all of it, then you're not going to get complete milk removal. Now, some peculiar things about the cell. This is the way I try to represent it to, when, I, when I talk to students. And I, I, as far as I can tell, this is a, an appropriate way to think about this. A cow, getting a cow to milk, let her milk down is usually like falling off a log. It's, you, know, you walk up to them and say, boo, if they're conditioned to do it, they'll let their, their milk down. They respond to very low levels of oxytocin. So they have a low threshold responding to oxytocin, so you start stimulating the udder, she lets her milk down, and that, that surge of, of, of oxytocin will last several minutes, maybe five-ish minutes, something in that ballpark. On the other hand, the sow has a very high threshold for oxytocin. And so milk ejection only lasts for about 10, 15, 20 seconds. 10, 15, 20 seconds. It's done. It's over. That's it. All right? So all that other behavior, and we'll get into that here in a few moments, is important for stimulating oxytocin, removal of milk, stimulating prolactin, but the actual milk ejection part is only for a few seconds. So she's very, very stingy in terms of, of letting her milk down. And certainly you can probably tell already that, well, not all the time do they hit this peak and so if her, you know, for whatever reason she doesn't actually get to that point, then even though the pigs, everybody goes through the motions, all the behavioral things are going to happen, but she doesn't actually let her milk down, there's no milk removal during that particular nursing. So I, again, there are different kinds of estimates about how many times a day that's going to happen and, and so on. Uh, but it certainly does happen uh, reasonably often. Okay, some of you perhaps seen this, this uh, uh, diagram, uh, kind of a flow chart and looking at the behavior of the sow and the behavior of the pigs. Um, suckling bout is initiated. Uh, she goes through some initial grunting, alerts the pigs. They start wandering around. You know, they wake up, start wandering around and everything, nuzzling, nuzzling around. She'll lay down on her side, expose her udder. Uh, and then she goes into this rhythmic grunting, this once per second. Uh, uh, uh. It's very rhythmic. Right? And you can by, stand in the barn, and all of a sudden, I know the first time I ever heard it, which, again, you guys grew up with these animals. I didn't grow up with them. I, I read the book, okay. And I was standing there, heard some, some people over here talking and you know jabbering, and I was kind of half listening to them, and all of a sudden I realized, hey, it's there. It's happening. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's science in action. It's really going on. It's exactly what she's doing. They start assembling. They start massaging the gland, nosing the udder. Again, this, this, for this time frame, during that time frame, she lets down her oxytocin. There we go. Uh, the oxytocin released from the bloodstream. At about that same time, she goes to increase this grunting rate. Instead of, uh, 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 she'll increase the rate. Now, again, I've got a video. I'll show you a couple of examples here. Uh, for about 25 seconds. So, so when we go through the video, I'll show you here in a few moments, uh, uh, I have a caption up there that says, grunting rate increases or something like that. If, if you have, us old guys have these things called watches. Okay, I know you young people use these, what are they called, cell phones or mobile phones, anyway. Uh, time it, and it's, it's dead on. It's about 20, 25 seconds, something like that. And what you'll see is a change in behavior. They go from a slow suckling to very, very rapid. I can't even, I can't even move my hands fast enough to, to, to mimic what they do. And they'll sit there like they're on a, sucking on a straw, and they'll kind of pull back a little bit and they're really focused. There's none of the stuff of nosing around and moving around. They're really focused. But again, that whole process is only going on for a few seconds. After the milk ejection is over then, her grunting subsides. They continue nuzzling the gland. Again, that's important for, oops, there we go. All this is important for release of prolactin. Again, that's in, somewhat independent of the oxytocin release. Um, uh, and then, you know, she does her thing. She rolls on her belly or stands up or whatever the case may be and they go off and fall asleep. So that's your nursing bout, and then 45 minutes, 50 minutes later, they go through the whole process again. So it's this part that, that we're really, again, to, to, to emphasize, this is the part where you actually get milk ejection. If the pig's there to remove the milk, it'll remove the milk, and it removes most of the milk that's in the gland. Um, and again, we'll get to the consequences of, of not removing the milk here from individual glands in a minute. Okay, what happens when milk is not removed? Well, the, again, one of the easiest, I showed you involution, but Another example of that here is that early, uh, right after farrowing, is if you, now again, I realize you guys are, are loading her up, okay? You got too many babies, 
you're going to load her up. But if you have less than, than full number, however many glands she has that are functional, uh, those glands that are suckled, they're going to grow. This is basically a wet weight of gland. They're going to grow, as I've shown you before, hitting peak at around this time frame in here. Um, those that are, are not suckled are going to involute. And again, it's going to take them about seven days to get down here to this flat line. So within about seven days, it's completely it's down to wherever it's going to be. It's, it's pretty well stabilized. That's how much wet weight it is. That's not the same thing as function, how, how functional it is. So the, how does this impact uh, cross-fostering pigs and early lactation, as an example? So this is some work by Peter Tile in Denmark. Uh, by the way, this represents a pig. OK, got that little smiley face. Everybody's happy. So day one, that is farrowing. The pig's on that gland. Happy, happy, happy. Everybody's happy. Going to stimulate the gland. It's going to grow as much as it'll grow, et cetera, et cetera. On the other hand, what, it, what they did was they taped off glands, uh, several glands, and they left the tape on them for 24, 48, 30, or 72 hours. And then pulled the tape off, tried to put a pig on there and see what would happen. And then also looked at some physiological and uh, um, molecular biology kinds of uh, indicators and so on and so forth. 24 hours later, pull the tape off, put a pig on there. The pig will take it getting milk, but it's already started to kind of undergo involution a bit. And so it's getting less milk on average. All right, so it's not quite as happy. It's, it's OK, but not quite as happy. On the other hand, you pull it off after 48 hours, and it's been sitting there for 48 hours, starting this involution process, this regression process. It may not get enough milk to even bother. OK, some glands might have a, give a little bit of milk. Some glands are already past the point of no return. They're not going to produce much milk. And certainly, if you wait to 72 hours, it's all over. It's just it's not going to recover. It's, it's done. That particular gland is done, and so this pig's going to have to do something else there along the way. So early on, again, this doesn't really matter whether it's at farrowing or whether it's any time. I mean, what do you guys do? You get, what do they call it? Bump, bump weaning? Is that what they call it? Am I right? Or is it something like that where you take pigs that are not doing so well and put them on a salad you just wean? Is that right? Okay, thank you. I'm just looking for some confirmation there. Again, if you do it right away, that's okay. But if you kind of wean the, wean the sow and then two days later say, oh, I think I'll go put some pigs on. No, it's not going to work because she's already well into this involution process. And it's, in, and it's too late. It's not going to recover. You're not going to regain that. OK, does it matter? This is one that that's, uh, people have, have asked me over the years. And we finally have some good data. I've been conjecturing on this. And, and I, I, by the way, I was right. But it's OK. That's beside, beside the point. I finally had some good data to, to talk about this. So does it matter? If, uh, if a gland, a particular gland, was suckled in the previous lactation. So if it was suckled in the first lactation, does it affect what it does the second lactation? If it's not suckled in the first lactation, like this guy, this gland, uh, does it impact what it does in the next lactation? And the answer is yes. We finally got some data. Chantal Farmer up in Canada, just, just, it's, it's actually just now, uh, I think it's on, online, Journal of Animal Science, but if it's, it'll be out in print if it hasn't already been out in print. This is really what we're talking about. We're taking this gland that's been suckled in the first parity, su suckled in the first parity, this gland was not suckled in the first parity. And then in the second parity, if you look at that, uh, if they were all suckled, so the ones that were suckled in the first parity and suckled in the second parity, this much mammary mass, significantly more mammary mass was developed than, the one, than this guy that was not suckled in the first parity, but then suckled in the second parity. So it does make a difference. The lactational history of the gland does make a difference. And the same way with uh, pig weight gain. So uh, body weight gain uh, between day two and day, four, day 14, again, significantly less in terms of the uh, uh, not suckled, whether not suckled in the first gland, uh, parity or not. So it used to be that people would ask the question, we own these gilts, first pregnancy gilts, should we load them up or should we not load them up? Again, I think at this point, maybe you guys have a different way of thinking about this because you've got too many of those young pigs running around anyway. So. Uh, the, the point is that it, it does matter, and, and, and to have them suckled in the first parity uh, will, will uh, impact that in the second parity. So we finally have some good data on that confirmation of what, what some of us have been talking about for a while. Okay, I'm going to quit here and take a few questions if you, if you have any. Uh, giving you a, a brief overview of lactation biology, and again, emphasizes the idea of milk removal from a gland. Milk removal from this gland is not the same as milk removal from this gland. This is a different milking machine than the one over here on the other side or wherever. And so again, as you think about all these other things that you're thinking about, kind of remember that in the background so that may help you understand some of the kinds of issues and, and challenges that you have uh, 
in terms of her ability to, to make milk and, and, and uh, get the, the pigs to, to thrive. Uh, again, I've, I've tried to emphasize this idea of a mammary gland pig unit. So this guy and this guy are growing together in concert. This is part of that dance. They're, they're, again, it's a dynamic relationship between them. This one's challenging that to make more milk. As it makes more milk, it challenges this guy to grow and, and so on. Again, this rapidly shifting interplay of physiology, whether it's uh, during the milk ejection phase or this more long, a little bit longer term in terms of this uh, mammary gland pig unit that I was talking about.